Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Uh, uh, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we are going to be talking about this book, Effortless Living, Wu Wei in the Spontaneous State of Natural Harmony with Jason Gregory. So welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you for having me on, CJ. It's a pleasure. Uh, I have to say, we were speaking earlier, and um, one of the things that uh, impressed me so much about this book is how uh, you've interwoven um, Hindu beliefs, Taoists, and Buddhists all, it's a focus on Taoists, but you've interwoven lots of similar concepts that that are the same across all these different um, religions. So I wanted to ask you how, like, how did this all come about? And I, and I asked you originally, like, are you a professor? Where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's completely un unintentional, um, like we were speaking about before. It's um, my wife, I met my wife back in 2007, and then we basically left Australia. And I, I had an interest in Eastern thought, but I never sort of, I didn't have the the uh, motiv the motivation to leave Australia. Mm -hmm. And we, we left Australia together, and it was completely unintentional. And, I, and I, I sort of just fell into it. And I just, studying the, especially the, the classical scriptures and this of, of all Hindu, Buddhist, and, <coughs> and also the Taoist tradition, it just felt like so natural for me. I don't know what what, I, what it was. I was just reading, and it was just it felt almost like a homecoming. Mm. It was like the first time actually I, I went to India. Like I went to Calcutta in India the first time, right. and it felt oh. like <coughs> like I was actually going home. You know, like it was really wow. a bizarre experience for me. It just felt that way. You know, like it wasn't anything metaphysical or anything like that. It was just the way the people were, the way in the craziness of what India is, I felt comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, it was strange, like, not that I never felt comfortable in Australia, but it was, I don't know, maybe a, a psychological thing, right? maybe, so, yeah, that's how I sort of fell into it, I, I was traveling, obviously, a lot through Asia, so, Nepal, India, uh, Thailand, Burma, Vietnam, Laos, and in the Middle East, Korea, Japan, and, um, yeah, so basically everywhere. And, and I was just, you know, studying, looking basically inside myself for the first time in my life. And then, and writing was something that naturally came to me. And, and, and most of my books, all three of those traditions are usually interwoven because I, I believe there's a, a common thread between them that's kind of been mixed and it's grown through, you know, this through Asia, basically, all the traditions are kind of interwoven a little bit. So, you know, we have we have that um, in in Asia. So, but that's basically the beginnings of of my work today. So, it's been a ten year journey. I've I've lived in mainly India, Nepal, and, and Thailand for for almost ten years. I've been I, I came back to Australia in 2010 for a year and a half, and then I went back. My, the fire was too was burning too much for me, so I just wanted to get back over there and and write and study and and practice. And, and so, so you mostly learned this stuff through reading texts. It sounds like is that right? It's through I did, I did I did a lot through learning through text and through reading. Just you know, I, I've probably read I, I can't even tell you maybe five hundred to six hundred books on 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 all three traditions. Yeah. Not just not just the text, but from teachers that I respect and and um, books that I'm just naturally interested in. But I have learned from from actual teachers. Like one of the first teachers I ever came across and I learned from was I don't know if you know Muji. Yeah, yeah I like Muji. Yeah, I learned. From, yeah, so I I came across Muji back in 2009. So it was back in the raw days, back in. Um, Tiruvannamalai in South India, so before Muji had really mm. become the phenomenon that it is today. So it was much, much of the innocent beginnings. And so I learned a lot from him. And then I've learned a lot from a lot of um, Buddhist monks in Thailand. Um, too difficult to say all their names. <laughs> um, Would you sit in a monastery? Like, how did you find... Yeah, yeah, across? I'd sit in a monastery. And, and, you know, there's monks. Thailand is, Thailand is an interesting place. Like, you can go to Bangkok and there's there's monks that are interwoven through. Right. So they're just like, you could have a coffee with a, co a monk, no problem. Yeah, you, you could, if okay. you're lucky. Yeah, they are interwoven, not that interwoven. Okay. But they're, they're, yeah, <laughs> they are around. And, and also, I should mention, I, I've um, 
learned a lot also from uh, Sadhguru as well. Not not personally, but I've been in the presence of Sadhguru and that in India. And if you know who a Sadhguru is, um, he's a very popular actually teacher these days. But um, and and also uh, lamas and rinpoches um, up in northern India and in Nepal. You know, so okay. not that I know the Dalai Lama personally, but I've been in that that atmosphere and that space and, and learn from those sort of people yeah. as well. So, so. you so you constructed this book through talking and then also through reading five hundred books, which is pretty impressive. All right. So interestingly enough, I um I've there were a whole bunch of concepts in this book that I, I was hoping that we could kind of talk about through mapping us to um a real life experience because What's hard sometimes, I think, when I read these books, we're like, oh, okay, what am I going to do now? Like, and I know that part of that is there is nothing to do. You know, it's just about reading the book. But I was thinking about how, how this maps to my life. And uh, in the Western, you know, in the U.S., there's this idea of, um, well, the predominant way of thinking is one in which most people are considered, in your book, considered useless, right? And 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 mm-hmm. and I, I love this whole idea: is there's nothing more useless than Wu Wei, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and it's the idea of um, of you know the typical way of being that is proposed in your book, effortless li- living, is about just being more um, receptive, calm, you know. Uh, which is the nature of the book mm. and how um, I've been trained, even uh, someone who's Chinese, I've been trained uh, actually both through my Chinese lineage and also my Western lineage to it's about planning for the future, controlling and using power to create the best possible outcomes. And so uh, and why you do those things so that you can accomplish more, accrue more power um, and prestige and be successful. And so anyone who doesn't do these things is considered useless. So I, I really appreciated this, this, this chapter on uselessness because I, I realized that um, uh, I've been trained to view a lot of the stuff that's in the, the concepts in this book is, is useless. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, 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 yeah. so, tell me a little bit about your own experience because you know you you left um, as we were talking earlier twenty eight to go you know just travel, which a lot of people be like twenty eight. That's at the you know the peak of your career, and you're just gonna travel and sit around in a monastery. What's going <laughs> on, Jason? I don't know what your parents said. Like what ha- <laughs> what happened during well, your own moment of wu wei? Well, um. Yeah, I don't know. It was just a, that that one was just a. I just went on a whim. You know what I mean? When I left at twenty eight, I I didn't really think about it. Um, maybe I would just. I had come to terms with my own uselessness. Who knows? But <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad you you mentioned that because especially as, as you'd know, CJ, because you are Chinese. That you know, places like China and that have kind of divorced themselves from a lot of their traditional roots. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's basically we could say a Marxist nation, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I mean, people, I know people in China are actively trying to get back to Taoism and Buddhism. You see kind of a little bit of a renaissance happening, but it, it's definitely a, a minority compared to the striving and the, the success, success driven culture that we've built around the world. And, you know, China has one of the more um, militarized education systems, I would say, you know, it's much like South Korea where it's very whip in hand and get to school and and cram and they don't understand anything about the way that we retain memory and and stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. they've, you know, divorced from basic, basic health and sanity, which is what's going on. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, try like, um, so when we look at um, the, the differences um, is that, you know, China especially, China and India and Asia in general have different, cogn- like a different cognitive makeup. You know, we, mm-hmm. if we take it way back into evolution, then the way that both cultures evolved, both, both East and West were environmentally determined. 
which developed our, our cognitive abilities differently. And this is what's having an effect on um, Asians at the moment because they naturally, I mean, this is a little bit, sorry, this is a bit off the, the useless path at the moment, but um, they, so for example, if you look at China, naturally they were, they lived in large communities and it was, a, it, it was focused on rice cultivation because that was the cultivation of food. So naturally a lot of their philosophies and a lot of their beliefs were more holistic. So they were more tied to nature. They understood how we are connected to nature. This also ties over into India and Southeast Asia. And then when we look at the birth of Western societies, you know, roughly around the same time too, we can go, we can trace this back to around 3000, 2500 BCE. You see um, in Greece where we have small bands of community that are much more individualistic. So, you know, the main source of food was, um, was fishing, you know, herding cattle, all of these things that can be be done in an in in individualistic manner. So mm. thousands of years of this, you know, you, you develop different um, parts of the brain, actually. So, you know, if we look at the brain, we have the prefrontal cortex in the front here, and then we have all of these unconscious regions of the brain, which are much more connected to holism and, and, and kind of an intuitive sense of, how life is as opposed to the front prefrontal cortex, which is, you know, it's like a, it's like a knife. You're, you're cutting up reality. It's analytical. It's intellectual. You need both. That's the point. You need both of these, but, but the difference is, is in both societies for, for a long period of time, they focused on one or the other, you know? So, so in China, if, you know, if we stick with the theme of the book, there was a focus on collectivism, on how everything is connected, everything is interrelated, the heart of Taoism and the heart of Chinese culture. And if we look at the West, you know, it's much more individualistically orientated where you have, you know, you become a go-getter, success-driven, individual interest, self-preservation, so forth and so on. So what we have now is we have the education system is built on developing just the prefrontal cortex, so on developing and promoting individualism. So this has had, um, people don't want to speak about this, but this has had um, direct psychological impact on especially Far Eastern Asia, if we, if we, if we look at Japan, South Korea and, and China, where teen suicide rates are the highest in the world, mm. um, all of these certain things that are causing psychological problems. So. You know, this go-getter attitude is actually, in some sense, as Lao Tzu, you know, skillfully pointed out 2,500 years ago, is against our, against our nature, against the way that we are as humans. You know, he, his beliefs are that we are pretty, our, our needs are pretty simple, humans, you know, you know, food, clothing, and shelter, you know. So we've gone and complexified the world you know, especially now, like he, he'd probably fall out the window if he saw the world now. But his his key point is is that this all of this socialization is actually destroying us, destroying us psychologically, impacting our health. And we're seeing that now, CJ, as you know, like we, we look at mental health issues in the world. We look at all of the obesity rates. This right. socialization is having an impact. No one wants to talk about it because then we've got to actually talk about individualistic culture. We've got to talk about individual self-interest, how the working environment set up, how the educational systems are set up. So yeah. this kind of gets back. Yeah, I think, so I think, yeah. I think the thing yeah. that for, in, what I'm, what I'm noticing is that if it's uh, individualism versus collectivism is what you're talking about and what you're finding in China is that used to have a, in a lot of Eastern cultures, they had a necessity to be a collective culture now they probably feel an equal necessity to have an individualistic based culture forcing, you know, concentration on the, you know, prefrontal cortex versus these other parts. That, and so, and so it's almost like a balancing act. So if they were more yin before, they're more yang. And maybe the yang is getting like, a, 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 you know, it's no longer a balanced circle, but like an uneven, like a tipping of a scale where the yeah. yang is like heavy and the, you know, the yin is like this small, you know, little small, <laughs> small black circ, you know, uh, section yeah. and, the, and the yang is this big white section. And, and interestingly enough, you, I don't know if you know this because you're located in Australia, but 
So teens here in the U.S. have that similar kind of driven um, and and I don't know what you experience in Australia, but you know, there are teen girls cutting themselves as a way of resuming a sense of feeling and suicide rates and people shooting each other in high school. So there's, there's all these pressures. And at the same time, there are things like mindfulness program and meditation in some of the worst schools as a way of providing a peaceful home for like a, a small respite in a child's life where they may live in a chaotic environment, but they have like, you know, one minute at, you know, 15 minutes at school where they, you know, one of their homeroom teachers does a meditation with them. And so interestingly, in the West, people are, have lived this life for so long, and now they're like, I can't. They've reached a tipping point, <laughs> especially with their current president, for me at least, where you're just like me- trying to like balance the chaos in your mind through engaging in more collective, like where instead of actually an individualistic, we're trying to move back to the collective. So it's interesting, both sides, East and West, both balancing the yin and yang of their exactly. experience. Yeah. I was, I was going to mention that too. It, it is, it is interesting how in the West people have actually, especially since, you know, we, we would say after the second world war, people have had an interest in, look, we don't want that ever to happen again. Like, how do we get there? You know, how did this war happen? Vietnam war happened. There was a lot of, still a lot of resistance from a lot of people. And then people were naturally attracted to meditation and other forms of Eastern practices. And that's becoming, that's um, infiltrating a lot of, especially in America, infiltrating a lot of American culture and Australian culture and, and in Europe as well. And it is, the, it is kind of this balancing act. Um, there's obviously a long, long way to go because, you know, um, as Westerners, there's still a propensity to be analytical about things and, and not, um, how do I say, especially with Eastern philosophy, there's some people will treat it as if it's just a I don't know like a new fad a, a, you know like something that's like like that you don't need to know it that well to understand it and that's not yeah. really the case yeah there's, it's like eat less lot. fat eat less carbs you know do, go gluten free it's not it's like a fat like that yeah, yeah, yeah I think so like yeah that. I'm doing yoga which yeah, you're yeah. not doing yoga but you're doing the movements of yoga <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah good point yoga is a you know obviously a big one for that so you know, there is this this balancing thing, and and I think that there is. I think you made a good point that there is a fascination in China, and I know in South Korea because I've spent a lot of time in South Korea as well, um, with um, being being like a Westerner. You know, I mean, being you know, sorry to say this, but you know, especially in South Korea, they people want to be like a white person. They they say I've heard this said before, like. And I sort of say to them, like, you must be crazy. Have you seen those? Have you seen, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, have a look at me. I say to them, you know, yeah. so it's, um, yeah, there is, I think there's probably, you know, a natural attraction to the opposite, but there has to be this balancing thing. I, as you know, I speak about in the book that we live in a yin deficient world, actually. Mm-hmm. It's not just East. Um, it's not just Western no more. It's actually all across the world. We live in this yin deficient world where we don't cultivate enough um, time of not non doing in our day where we just completely do nothing. We relax. We allow our nervous system just to, you know, um, reach, reach a state of equanimity. Mm-hmm. We, we don't, we don't do that. We just, we keep filling our mind up full of whatever, whatever's there. We st- we're overstimulated. You know, my, my previous book, I speak a lot about that and, and fasting the mind and methods about, you know, how to get out of that. And, you know, I, it is, it is great. Like what you said, in, in high schools, they're implementing mm-hmm. mindfulness. And I also know in, in America, which is another good um, um, initiative that's happened in America, there's been Vipassana meditation in, in prisons. And that, yeah. and and so instead of just condemning prison inmates and this and that, let's try and, you know, deal at the root problems of why they're there and, and, and so forth and so on. So I think this is a brilliant thing and, and something that should be implemented all around the world, actually. Yeah, it's a Timber Hawkeye probably, right? Uh, Timber yeah. Hawkeye from um, uh, uh, who I've interviewed for Buddhist Boot Camp. He's doing beautiful work. So it's and, and it's hard, I think, because you know. In so I take myself as an example. So two years ago, well, I'm actually a career coach. So I mm. career and business coach, and so I help people during transition points when they're trying to figure out what next career they want to go towards. So I basically my my 
approach has, is mostly a linear approach and it's kind of a mix of let's get a sense of what is it that you want and then I'll say well what is it that you want to feel what it, will it look like so I try to get someone to do like a five sensory map which is more dealing with the unconscious versus kind of your you know the prefrontal stuff and, and what's interesting is even though I do and then I, tr I try to do all the stuff that's kind of the rational stuff so they're like good now I have a good clear specification of the job that I want and then I drag out this I drag out my shamanic drum <laughs> I drag yeah. out my drum <laughs> and then I'm like okay let's just you know now that we've done that uh, you, you're all your mind is appeased and calm down yeah. let's get into your heart and think about the things that make you happy and yes. I try to get into this flow state that you talk about um, mm. which I think you refer to as Wu Wei um, and maybe we can clarify exactly what that is since I don't want to, like, butcher the term. But, uh, you know, I try to get them in some state of stillness and quiet and so that they can tap their inner wisdom. And then I ask them about, you know, what is your purpose? Why are you here on earth? What's your mission? And things that they – if I try to do that from their linear mind, if I sat down – because I've done that before with businesses where – uh, I used to be in business strategy planning and you'd ask about someone's mission and their vision and it would take literally the whole day and you'd argue the whole time. And uh, it's interesting because I bring out, bring out the drum and people are like, boom, they get it in like 20 minutes or less. <laughs> but it is interesting. Yeah. So um, anyway, so my, my, my question for you, I guess, is, you know, in your your own experiences, you know, this idea of controlling and making things happen. So that's one approach, right? So career coaching, I'm like trying to get people to like, what's your game plan? What do you want? Let's get clear in your mind what you want because you're able to get there. Um, how do you see, and that's more of a doing s scenario, mm -hmm. wh what do you see as yourself as the, like a recent challenge of doing and being when you had to kind of balance the two? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and, and I like what you said with the shamanic drumming, like just that simple activity brings them back down to the heart. And then they can actually think clearly about what their goals and purposes are yeah. instead of us being here all the time yeah. and thinking we know where we're going when you've got to sort of get out of the head to, yeah. to, to know where you're going. So the challenges for myself, um, especially is, you know, obviously uh, I'm a writer, so, you know, there's a, there's a doing component to, to, what I do and, you know, teaching and this and that. So there is obviously planning and, and, you know, we're here today. I had to, we had to plan this interview. Right. There's obviously, I'm not off the map, like, like, like a Lao Tzu sort of figure, like a, as a hermit, but there, there, there has to be a fine balancing. Like you have to always, um, people have to think about like what you said before, like what's the simple things, just the simple things in life that you appreciate, mm -hmm. you know? So, okay. I appreciate for myself. I, I'm grateful to have my wife. I'm grateful to have my health. I'm grateful that the sun keeps coming up every morning. You know, just the, the, the very simple things that keep you grounded and then allow you to extend out of yourself to to express yourself in whichever mm -hmm. way that is people choose. You know, so, but I think that we lose touch with the the very simple non-doing things in life that just happen, as, as Lao Tzu would say, they just naturally happen of themselves with us having to think about it. You know, so there's, I think we've got to intelligently kind of approach life like that a little bit. We have to think about how, okay, wh what in life just happens of itself. And when you, when you, when you look at a percentage of that, most of things just happen of themselves, you know, right. you and, you know, you and I don't know what we're going to talk about in the next five minutes, or we don't know what's going to happen in half an hour. We can plan, but usually our plans sometimes get thrown in mm -hmm. the bin, you know, like, mm -hmm. We control such a small bandwidth of, of our life, you know, which people don't, um, I think, understand or appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that's why people, when they do encounter situations, when they do have to bend and be flexible, they they um, meet that circumstance with resistance, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a state of effortless living, when you're in a state of wei, then you will move with life intelligently, skillfully, because you know you've obviously seen that situation before, that circumstance, and you know how to intelligently move with it. Like in the, in the same sense of uh, lightning, you know, lightning always finds the path of least resistance. So, mm. you know, 
that doesn't mean you need to be passive and, and so forth and so on, but it means that you just intelligently know how to move with life instead of um, confronting it. So for myself personally, it's been, you know, obviously 10 years of cultivating that ability, especially meditation has certainly helped. And also living away from my own familiar environment has helped. Mm. It, it, it's made me, it's trained me to adapt to, to different circumstances almost all the time, you know, yeah, like, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so when I drop myself in Calcutta and in India for the first time, it's like going from, you know, it's, it, <laughs> Australia and India is like chalk and cheese, you know what right. I mean? It's not, it's, you know, so I always tell people actually traveling can help you get into this state because mm. it, what it does is it starts to crack that cultural framework you have built in your mind, which you probably think you haven't built, but we all have subtly on a, on a, on a very subtle level. And so that that's also helped as well, but... You know, getting back to what I was saying earlier, I think that we just have to approach, have to understand that majority of our life is happening to us, as opposed to um, us imposing our will on life. And you know, this this goes back to some of the key parts of my book where I talk about Confucius and Lao Tzu, where they had this, you know, there's an imaginary debate in there from them, where you know, Confucius is like, you need to do, you need to achieve, you need to, you know, um, create this and that to to you know, to live life and, and mm-hmm. to actually induce the Tao in the world. Mm-hmm. And Lao Tzu's like, no, the, the Tao naturally exists in the world naturally. Um, we just have to get back to our original nature. You know, this is the, the metaphor between the uncarved block and the uh, polished polished block and the polished mm-hmm. piece of wood. But Lao, Confucius is the polished the carving and polishing metaphor where we need to we need to become somebody. We need to be like this. Lao Tzu's like drop it you're already perfect the way you are mm-hmm. you know um obviously you will change naturally in time but you don't have to be so anxious about changing yourself and making yourself this certain person that is basically you, you're making yourself a person that's a so, that society wants you know right. so you're, you're you're actually developing your psychological state you're adapting that to what an external influence wants you to be so you know Lao Tzu's kind of saying why don't why aren't you whole and complete the way you you naturally are so you know yeah. this gets back to ties back to also what you yeah. were saying earlier CJ about the useless useless metaphor yeah so instead, instead of being a straight and rigid tree that can be cut down in its prime you 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 embrace your own uselessness you, yeah. you embrace <laughs> well, what actually brought up for me is in the, uh, one of the passages, um, you talk about the origin of synchronicity, which is really just this mix of these two things. And um, you talk about, uh, so let me see if I can, so you said um, Pantajali understood that the doing of the practice is in alignment with the evolutionary unfolding. So the doing of practice, so whether you're doing meditation or um the is the practice or maybe doing a yoga practice or doing your work like your writing is a mm-hmm. is the practice of alignment with the evolutionary unfolding while the non-doing of stillness brings one in resonance with the eternal self which is the source of the Tao within us this Vedic wisdom that teaches Atman is Brahman the aspects of doing and non-doing harmonize with each other and bring forth unity between the changing and the changeless, or in other words, between motion and stillness. And this unified harmony manifested on an individual level is the origin of synchronicity, which I love this idea of that you mentioned. And this really struck me because I do think that actually when, when you were talking about Lao Tzu and Confucius, it's like I believe that both is, you know, there's some aspect of truth in both of these things. And, yes. And I guess it's and I guess it's when you're doing are you moved by the internal self? Is that the part that's doing or is, is as you describe it is it your linear self, the planning self that feels it needs to control and plan and act that's doing. And that I guess is probably the the d- discernment and distinction between those two. Does that yeah. make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, yeah. It, th- that's actually a complicated uh, chap- part piece of the chapter there, you know, and I'm, I, I'm glad you, you you brought it up. It's, you know, in, in China, you have to think of this concept of mutual arising. So mm-hmm. um, I think you pronounce it Shang Sheng. Mm-hmm. And 
and this mutual arising is basic. There's, there's kind of a phrase which is common in the East, not just in China, but also in, in, in India as well, where the universe produces consciousness and consciousness evokes the universe. So it's the, it's the chicken and the egg argument, you know, which was first. And so, you know, your question is really good because then it brings it back to, you know, who is doing, who is the planner, you know, and so we would have to think that, well, first of all, the, the Atman, as I mentioned in that, the Atman being the eternal self, being your base, you know, your undifferentiated consciousness, you know, that which is within you, CJ, that which is within me, that is um, not eternal, separate. Eternal, right. Yep. Eternal, yeah, it's not separate. So that I don't think um, needs to do anything. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like, I don't think that needs to do anything, but in the form of a human, there is an aspect of us where we need to be, you know, expressing our, I talk about in in the book, a concept called Li. Uh, it's actually a Neo-Confucianist and Taoist concept where we have a natural organic pattern within our mind. And that organic pattern with you, within you, CJ, might be this, this need to create great shows and and do everything that you're doing and for me it might be writing and teaching and so forth and so on there's kind of that intrinsic drive but it's kind of like an organic pattern that's kind of superimposed on you like a um you know lee is kind of referred to as the markings and jade you know the, the the fiber and muscle and the markings and jade so kind of like this this natural pattern that's that's in the world so um that could that's probably a driver of you know our linear process of you know planning and doing and obviously the eternal self is always behind everything that that we do so um the, the point of that and in what patanjali talks about especially in in classical yoga is is this kind of reunification well, ha actually he would say that they probably weren't ever separate you know it's kind of like mm -hmm. it's it's a mixture of both and this and this ties back into uwe as well um because uwe you know, if we translate Uwe, it, you can translate in a few ways. You can translate it as non-doing, um, non-force, effortless action. Or well, one way I like to translate it is intelligent spontaneity. So that is kind of the, the unification of, of basically the non-linear non eternal self and the linear analytical Jason and CJ and everyone else who was listening. So it's yeah. a unification of personhood with the 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 eternal essence of the universe. So the, you know, in Taoism, especially in, and also in Zen Buddhism, they don't like to kind of separate those, you know, in Indian philosophy, they, they'll make a dis sometimes a distinctive gap between um, your ego and, and your eternal self. And in this sense, they're saying that it's not, well, Lao is not saying that your ego is the problem. It's, he's kind of more so saying it's all of the, the influences of the world that turns you into mm -hmm. A strong ego and and that so you know yeah there is you know we, we can definitely say that Jason and CJ are actively planning and actively doing and it, it is this prefrontal cortex is doing aspect of ourself that is doing but in the in the background there is always this eternal presence that kind of or always knows too when you've gone too far you know mm -hmm. like so you know obviously the problem is in, in modern culture is people have kind of lost that faculty of understanding oh, I'm at the I'm at the cliff's edge now like if I keep pushing and pushing and pushing I'm going to go into well basically mental illness and all sorts of health problems so yeah you know so yeah, yeah. I, almost, I almost view it as I mean when I think about it I think about it as if, if Lee is in, in maybe another parlance is your or your essence your in 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 Hindu philosophy, they talk about um, that uh, individ uh, we have an individuated point of consciousness, and mm. so within that individuated point of consciousness is a specific way in which we are meant to we are we are, you know am I going to be a peonies a rose uh, you know a tree like you know how how is it that I'm going to express myself as other plants do or animals in nature. And so, you know, a tree is just being a tree. And you yeah. know, whether you're an oak tree or a maple tree, there's going to be uniqueness. And I think that's what Lee is, right? It's the uniqueness yeah. in whether you're a maple tree or an oak tree. And so 
when you're tapping, if I'm, okay, let's say I'm a, a, a iris. That's one of my favorite flowers. So let's say that I'm an iris. And so yes. if I'm tapping into my internal self um, as an iris, I'm going to still express that I'm an iris, even though I'm growing just like you, who is a, I don't know what kind of flower you want to be, or maybe you want to be a tree, <laughs> but you as an oak tree. Okay. So you have an oak tree. You're actually expressing yourself as an oak tree and tuning into the eternal, um, internal self, even though you're a tree and I'm uh, a, 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 an iris, a, a, a plant, a flower. So I think that we can, so, but we're still doing, we're still getting water and we're still using the sun and converting that into growth and flowering and blossoming, you know, in my case, and with you, like dropping, le you know, creating leaves and, mm. and acorns or whatever. So <laughs> it, it, but, but it's a great, yeah, so, sorry, CJ, it's a great point because like, I, I like that. I like that metaphor because you, when we think about us humans, right. we're much more, we're much more complex than, right. than the structure of a, of a flower. So you're right. expressing yourself as a radio host. Right. I'm expressing myself as a, as a, as a writer, you know, it's a, we need to think about it like that. And, and also it comes full circle also in Taoism too, because, you know, this point, the point, one of the points is, is that there's this other principle in Taoism called ying and ying is uh, mutual resonance or, or interdependence. So hmm. the idea is that when you, you express your Li purely, then you start to, um, harmonize with the world and actually bring forth the Tao into the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, philosophy, I believe, because, you know, you know, especially if we look at like musicians, you know, we, if we look at musicians, for example, musicians inspire a lot of people, they bring a lot of joy to people's hearts. And so their artistic, their Li, essentially right. their Li is bringing ying to the world, mutual resonance and interdependence, which is actually, you know, enriching the world and bringing the Tao in, in that way into the world and inspiring yeah. other people. Yeah, you know, so, so I was just talking to a friend of mine where he was asking about coaching and he said, well, you know, do, what, hap what happens in coaching and, uh, and how often do people find the job that they want and why do you even do coaching? And I said, well, oftentimes what people haven't done is found their Lee. And in, 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 in your parlance, I would say they haven't figured out your unique who th what they want in addition to their unique way of expressing themselves in the world, whether it's through a radio show or a writer or like even in the way that I do my radio show, it's about like providing knowledge and then also practical experience. Like that's kind of the way that I do it because that's my lead. Like I don't know why, but I just do it. But once, but once someone gets really clear about what their lead is, their special way of seeing the world, their fingerprint, and can describe their fingerprint mm -hmm. and what they want in the world at that juncture – what I find, and I said, it's, I said, I don't, it's not me. I know it's not me, but what happens is 75% of the people that I work with in career coaching, once they get super clear with what they want, I'll hear literally the next phone call or like maybe a couple weeks later, the weirdest thing happened. Someone called me about a job offer and it's exactly like really close to the thing that I want. I'm like, oh, that's great. And I try to be surprised because it's it's very surprising, right? That you get yeah. super clear with your Lee and your blueprint and and yeah. directionality and all your energy is in alignment and focusing <laughs> with this. And then what happens, right? Synchronicity happens, and the universe yes. throws you the job that is going to help you move into the next part. And and it's nothing I'm doing. And and they're like, uh, oh, isn't it magic? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of magic, <laughs> and it kind of yeah, yeah, not, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, that's the thing. It appears magic to our analytical mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like synchronicity and those experiences we have when we are in alignment with non-doing and doing is that it's actually just it's it's a natural phenomenon of, of the way nature expresses itself. You yeah. know, like so if your energy is going into that and you're moving in that direction, obviously things are going to happen for you. You know, right. if you're not doing anything and – and you're not fo you're not expressing your Lee, then not much is going to happen for you, you know. So yeah, you know, and a lot of people, you know, they think, um, you know, but isn't um, 
expressing your Lee counterintuitive and, and not really because, you know, um, as with Wu Wei, like the, the idea is that you don't just do nothing. The idea is that you are still doing, but the sense of you doing it as a person with invested interests has been eliminated. You're actually just expressing your deepest nature and you're moving the way you're moving as nature intended, you know. Yeah. And it's an interesting story that um, when Shunro Suzuki first went to famous Zen master, first went to um, San Francisco back in, I think maybe the 60s, and he was teaching Zazen and, 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 and meditation practices like that. And someone said, like, isn't, like, we're getting up every day at five o'clock to, to meditate for one hour and or, isn't all of this, like, doing against sort of the Our natural way, way. <laughs> like natural we're sleepy way, yeah. Yeah. yeah and then and then Shunrei said he said it was beautiful he said no you don't understand this um this is what um buddhas do buddhas just meditate like a dishwasher dishwashers so you're you're naturally a buddha so buddhas meditate that's just what they do so it's you don't have to think overthink it it's just a it's it's an action that you're expressing that Lee aspect of yourself that is just natural to you, um, you know, but you're not doing it with a, with a sort of a vested interest or you're not super driven and, you know, barging people out of the way to jump on top of the heap, you know? So, you know, this goes back to also, I was, sorry, I mentioned this story, CJ's in, in the bag of a Gita where you've got this, this famous phrase, Nish Karma Karma, in Sanskrit, and nishkarma karma is yeah, basically means um, not being attached to the fruit of your action. Mm. So Arjuna is like mm. kind nish of karma karma. Yeah, nishkarma karma. I so like it. okay. Yeah, so Arjuna is sort of talking to Krishna, and he's saying like, oh, I don't want to go into you know because the whole epic of the Mahabharata is go him going into the battle against his friends and his family. So Krishna is kind of saying you're still you know if we if we can bring it to modern cognitive science terms you're still in this part of the brain you're still identifying with yourself as arjuna and you're not expressing yourself naturally as what is needed right. in this moment so what is needed in this moment is for you to participate you know they they, they indians always seem to take things to a, to an extreme you need to, <laughs> by you need slaying to, your family yeah, you need to slay your family to exactly. actually find, find your true self so <laughs> But that's kind of the essence of Uwe. That's kind of the essence yeah. of what we've been talking about. It's like you don't have to really get hung up on, you know, am I doing this? Um, is this me wanting to do this or this and that? You, you kind of have so to. It's so hard. It, it's so hard to do that in practice because mm. so in January. So last year I had a really good year. I made money that seemed to fall out of the sky and I barely worked like it didn't feel like work. It was just a miraculous year where I made a huge amount of money for very little work. It was a good year. So I thought <laughs> this year I'd like the same thing to happen. And so junior rolls around and I thought nothing is happening. And then February rolls around and I thought, well, it must be that I need to rest and this must be, it's supposed to be a fallow time for me to do nothing. If, if I believe in um, Uwe, it, 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 I don't have to do anything. If it's meant to be that I get a job or have a year similar to last year, it will just happen. I don't have to go make cold calls and like, how you doing? I'm just wondering <laughs> if you would like to have me come back again. You know, I did a little bit of that, but I was like, yeah. Uh, you know, if, if it's meant to happen, it's yeah. going to happen. So just chill out, try to like write and do some of your creative things that you enjoy doing. Use this fallow time to like go on the inside and enjoy things and just mm. have trust and faith that the money will come. And I was like, how is the money supposed to come? I'm like, I don't. So this is me talking to my, my faithful self. How's the money <laughs> going to come? I don't know. <laughs> just believe that it will. But why? Yeah. How am I supposed to believe in that? It's like it has in the past. It's like okay, <laughs> well, just sit around. Sit around. You better send a couple of emails if you want any jobs to come. It's like I'll send one or two. But honestly, <laughs> I believe that something will come. Okay, so so this is the conversation I had myself with January, February, and then March, and then yeah. miraculously, um, 
a girlfriend called and said, hey, I would like you to do this work, which has then led to more work, which has led to more <laughs> work. And I'm not working very hard still and making decent amount of money. And then just um, literally yesterday, someone said, I want you to do this gigantic body of work and it's going to take you for the whole year. And it literally came out of the blue. I had no I idea that, that this was happening. Yeah. Uh, it just came out of the blue. And so... To me, that's this. It, it combines this idea of uselessness because I was truly feeling useless. <laughs> and people were like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Nothing. I'm just waiting for, for the universe to manifest something." And they're like, "Yeah, good luck with that, sister." You know. <laughs> and I was like, "But I, I, I want to stay congruent. I want to see if you can live this life in this particular way." So I thought, I gotta have faith. I don't have to do anything, but I thought I'm gonna try. I made enough money last year that I don't have to work this much this year. So I'm going to just try this year to see what happens if I just yeah. literally do nothing. I mm. write and I enjoyed my free space, but I was feeling extremely useless at that time because I had all this space <laughs> and I was having fun, but I was like a little bit nervous. And But yeah. it is the ultimate um, test of trust and faith to it live is. this it way. Is. And it's so damn hard. <laughs> It is, yeah. Well, you know, look at it, look at our values, um, CJ. Like you and I both have been brought up in the West. It's like, so when we we are when we are in these times of uselessness, we don't we we sometimes look to like I gotta I gotta be doing something. Surely something has to be happening for me, and then we don't understand that maybe this time is just to pause, reflect, you know, take the foot off the accelerator, and you know you know tying it back to Lao Tzu's point you know we don't value space you know mm -hmm. he and he always and he always uses like a like a cup as a metaphor what, what's more valuable the cup the the uh, the cup or the space within the cup and his point is it's the space within the cup that's important the cup you know if you don't have any if you don't have any space you can't enjoy a beverage a, an, an enjoyable beverage you know so it's um and I think that that's kind of superimposed on our life when we have these moments of space and time and time to reflect we don't use it wisely or we don't appreciate it and then when it's gone then we're sort of looking back going oh i wish i you know <laughs> i wish i had hung out and relaxed <laughs> yeah i wish i relaxed in that time you know so. yeah it's very true i just think that um there's so many there's so many wonderful ideas in your book about i mean and it's hard to do like as a Westerner trying to live in this ooh, ooh way kind of way where you're just doing nothing and waiting for your higher self to guide you to movement, it's extremely hard to do. It is possible, and it yeah. takes huge amount of courage to do, as you mentioned in your book. And, uh, and you have to be okay with being seen as useless because you will because you're being measured against people who are in a completely different, you know, uh, way of living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, people just have to be okay with that and understand that, you know, even if they, um, they don't want to practice that, they have to understand that even parts, a lot of, a lot of their life is actually like that anyway, regardless of if you're practicing <laughs> it or not. That's <laughs> true. It's like, if you really, truly look at your life, it's doing this anyway. So you can be disillusioned and think that you're controlling everything, but you're really not. It, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, but, you know, there's a lot of peace. Like you said um, before, CJ, when, when you took people through that journey and brought them back into the heart, their life becomes more clear. Their perception and their understanding of life is much more, you know, vivid when, when they come back into that space. So, you know, I'm kind of telling people, you can come back into that space and you can also live skillfully in the world and you, and you still are doing things, but you're not doing it so much as a person and mm -hmm. with a vested interest mm -hmm. in the world. I love it. Any other, uh, so we have to close, but um, thank you so much. So uh, thank, we've thank been you, talking to me. Jason Gregory about his book, um, Effortless Living, Uwe and the Spontaneous State of Natural Harmony. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.